A few years ago, I had a, a side job as a preaching coach at Denver Seminary. For some reason, Dr. Scott Winnig, who's a friend of mine, asked me to come and help young developing students learn how to preach God's good and perfect word. And I enjoyed it for a season. You know, Craig, you were one of my students, if you recall that. That was an interesting experience for you and for me. Uh, I nearly failed, Craig. He's incredible. I'm kidding. Well, you know, I noticed something while I was a teacher. There was this marked difference between wildly gifted students, ones who are like way better than me. I would often be like, you should be teaching this class, not me. Some of you here are like, why on earth did they ask you to teach preaching? I still don't know. I guess they figured I'm just honest enough to tell the truth. So the difference between the really good students, and maybe we'll call them the developing students, the developing students, was their ability to conclude the sermon. The really good students, they would figure out a way to you know, have this perfect landing of the plane. We knew exactly where we had gone, exactly where we were going, what we were called to do with it, and all of that, and it was wonderful. I said, well done, good and faithful servant. And then, well, our developing students often had struggles in two ways. Either one, they would have false landing after false landing after false landing. It was like, have you ever had like the airport's too full and you just have to do laps around the city. Have any of you ever been on an airplane like that? You just want to get there and you just can't. That was one way. Or it would be a crash landing. I mean, the landing gear was gone. All the children on the plane were crying. We had no clue what had happened. You could see what had happened. They looked at the clock. They said, I have like 30 seconds to wrap this up and I have five more points. So I'm just going to wrap it up. (laughs) Now, many of them became wonderful preachers later in life. I'm convinced of that. I know some of them. But what I notice is that conclusions really matter in preaching, and conclusions really matter in in all of life. A really good book, if you ever notice that you just really need to pay attention at the conclusion, I have this weird thing about me that when I have about five pages left in a book, I get really nervous that someone is going to interrupt me and ruin the ending right? Because I'm like, I need to be alone for these five minutes. Oh, Lord, don't let anything happen for these next five minutes, right? But some of you aren't book nerds. Maybe you love movies, and you really want to know what happens because you're invested in the characters, unless you like those terrible Marvel movies where they always have that thing at the end that makes it so it never ends, so you buy a new one. That's why Marvel movies are awful. That's my opinion on it. (laughs) Unpopular opinion, I know. The curate doesn't agree with me. Or an email you get from your boss, or for me, from the bishop. They're often long, and you make sure to read to the bottom, because there might be an action item buried in there that if you miss, you might be in trouble, right? Conclusions matter in almost all parts of our lives, and we actually see this especially in books of the Bible. Today, we are going to conclude the book of Philippians, And Paul has very specific and important words that he wants to share with his church. As we've been preaching through the the marks of a healthy church, we've been looking at uh, the book of Philippians. There's this great letter that he gives to this church that he loves so much. And he says all of these ways that he is encouraged by them and all of these ways that he's admonishing them to grow. And we ought to pay very careful attention to how he concludes this book of encouragement, this book of admonition. And so today I want to look at the three final marks of a healthy church in the book of Philippians. First, we we see that a mark of a healthy church is utter reliance upon Christ in both hard seasons and in abundance. Paul says whether he abounds or he's brought low, he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. Second, a healthy church is marked by generous investment Paul thanks the Philippians that of all of the churches, they are the ones that have remained partners with him in his entire ministry. And third, and most importantly, the one that if this is the only one that you remember in this entire series, this is the one I would have you remember, that the church is called forth, sustained, and directed by grace. In nearly all of Paul's letters, he ends with grace. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians 4. 
10 through 13. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You know, this reveals two really important things to us. First, it reveals to us that the Christian can face suffering and be carried through it through utter reliance upon the strength of Jesus Christ. Have you ever faced a trial in life and wondered, Will I make it through this? Or will I make it through this as the same person on the other side? Some loss that you have faced, and you wonder, without that person in my life, can I be happy again? Can I have joy again? Can I be myself again? Or some loss of reputation that you have, and you wonder, can I ever feel whole Can I ever feel confident in again? Can I ever feel like myself in a conversation again? Or maybe the loss of a job, and you say, can I ever feel secure again? Many of us have faced sufferings in our lives, and we ask, can I make it through this? And the hope of the Christian is that Christ can carry us through, that Christ can give us strength amidst any suffering that we might have. No matter how profound the loss, no matter how great the sorrow, he can give us strength. Look back at this passage with me. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And here's what we know about Paul. Most of the time, those all things are really hard things. Getting the snot kicked out of him publicly and repeatedly, being jailed, being lied about, losing his entire reputation. I mean, the guy was a Pharisee, for goodness sakes. His entire social status was built upon being an observer of the law and persecuting the church, and then he converts to it. He loses all social standing. He knows how to be brought low, and yet he knows that Christ can carry him through it. You know, we ought to ask that question, how? How does Christ carry us through these seasons where we are brought low? How does Christ give us strength when we feel weak, when we feel hungry or in need or have have profound loss? Well, he does it in many ways, but I want to just point out one. The one that I've been reflecting on lately, the one that captured the heart of Martin Luther, the the one that sparked the Protestant Reformation, the rediscovery of the gospel. Often, Jesus Christ strengthens his people by the Holy Spirit turning our hearts and our minds back to the promises of God. So often when we feel overwhelmed by grief or loss, when we feel like we are brought low, what do we do? Our eyes turn to our circumstances. And I'm not diminishing those circumstances. I'm not saying that those circumstances aren't hard. Paul doesn't say that he doesn't hunger, he doesn't have need, and he isn't brought low. He affirms that we can have incredibly profound suffering, and yet, in suffering, where do our eyes turn? Often we are strengthened in the Christian walk by turning to the assurances, the promises of the gospel. The promise that our God has declared us forgiven in his son. This is profound because when God speaks, it becomes a reality. I can declare that we are all millionaires. Laura and I were watching the office episode the other day where Michael goes out and says, we all got a thousand dollar bonus. And it wasn't true. Do you remember that one? It's like, yeah, we got a thousand. Stanley's calling us why put the wallpaper up. It was a lie. Michael didn't have authority to do that. But when Christ proclaims you are forgiven, it is a fact. Do we turn to the promises that God has given us? 
When he proclaims that you are a beloved child in whom he is well pleased, it is a fact. When he proclaims that he is coming again to make all things new, it is a fact. In a world where we lack assurance everywhere and therefore we feel as if we are hungry in need and brought low, we turn to the one place where we have utter assurance, the promises of the gospel. Family, this is why we celebrate the Eucharist every Sunday. Because in the Eucharist, we are given the promise that our God loves us so much that he gave us his very son to die for us. I have this profound privilege that I get to stand in, the, in your presence as Christ's representative to you. And so does Kyle, and so does anyone who stands up here. And we get to say something to you. As Christ's voice to you, I love you so much, I gave my very body for you. I love you so much, I gave my very blood for you. Do you cling to those promises every Sunday? Do you cling to those promises every day? Especially when you feel the billowing of the world, the sorrows that bubble up in your heart, the temptations of the devil. When you feel low, do you run to the promises of God? But it's interesting Paul also points out that we are called to run to the promises, to find our strength in Christ also when we abound. Look at it with me. For I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. And in every circumstance, I've learned the secret of placing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It's interesting, almost every you know, week I, I read Calvin's commentary on the passage I'm preaching on. It's, they're still very good. I just hate to say that. The Institutes is good, and that's just an appendix to his commentaries. He wrote one on every book of the Bible but Daniel and Revelation, which ought to give us pause because those are really confusing books. But that's neither here nor there. Calvin, in his commentary on Philippians 14, comments that it is actually easier for us to understand clinging to Christ, reliance upon Christ in suffering, and it's harder for us to understand in abundance, isn't it? Even in his day, he understood that, that when we abound, when we have plenty, when we don't feel want, we forget where our hope lies. So often, when we have plenty, our hope lies in our wealth, our hope lies in our status, Our hope lies in our capacity. We find hope not in Christ, but we find hope in ourselves. I had us read today this passage in which Jesus speaks to the rich young ruler, and he says, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And we often interpret that passage out of existence, but he said what he said, because so often when we are in wealth, when we are in plenty, where most of us are, We forget our status of utter reliance in all things. Family, do you take time to find your status, your identity, your hope in Christ and Him alone? Or are you always distracted with what you have, with what you can do, with how clever you might be? I know that in my life, the more confident I am, Sin creeps in the door quietly, doesn't it? Because I take my eyes off of where my confidence ought to rightly be, in Christ, in him alone. Whether he is in abundance or he is in need, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And this reveals to us that a church that is healthy is a church that is utterly reliant upon Christ. Now, second, Paul shows us that a healthy church, a growing church, is marked by generous investment. Look at verse 14. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payments and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. 
a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. As some of you know, uh, I studied economics in undergraduate. My passion was philosophy, and I did a degree in that too. But I found it unwise to only study philosophy. I'm sorry, Doug. I got a backup degree in economics as well. And I didn't like economics. I, I, I didn't enjoy it. However, I did it, you know, because I felt like I needed to. And I found that often economics as a discipline is lacking in philosophic and emotional intelligence. Very often, economists are just mathematicians that wanted to make more money, <laughs> so they became <laughs> economists. I don't blame them. Uh, and often, economists just boil everything down to maximizing profit, right? However, the reality is, is economics is just the study of human value. We invest in what we value. We invest in what we believe will give us some semblance of happiness, something that we believe will fulfill some desire in our heart or continue what we already enjoy. If you value really nice cars, you will take out a loan to get one. If you value really good coffee, you will forego other goods to pay exorbitant amounts of money for really good coffee every day. I will pay good money to sit at my favorite bar drinking my favorite kind of beer with my friends because I value that a lot more than I do technological devices. So I'll spend money there, but I won't buy the newest computer, right? Where we invest reveals what we value. And ultimately, that's just what the discipline of economics is. It's our collective values. And it's interesting. What does Paul say the values of the Philippians were? the ministry of the gospel. The Philippians invested in Paul from the very beginning of his ministry all the way to the very end of his ministry. I mean, what is the whole reason why Paul is writing this letter? Because they sent Epaphroditus to him to minister to him and gifts to bring him. From the very beginning of Paul's ministry, they invested. Why? Because they had been invested in and they valued what they received. These are all converts. This is the very beginning of the church. No one was in that church because they said, this is just what I was born into and what I ought to do. These are people who have their hearts gripped by the gospel. These are the people who had Paul evangelize them so that they would come to faith in Jesus Christ and find salvation in him and him alone. And so because that's what they valued, the salvation of their very souls, the being brought into newness of life with Christ, with one another, they invested generously. You know, often I hear well-intentioned, and there's truth to it, that, you know, we ought to invest in the ministry of the kingdom because it's God's money anyway. This whole idea of you should invest your money in the church, well, it's not your money anyway, so just hand it over. That's not actually how the parables talk about this. The parables give example after example of people who are, are given much, and they are expected much in what they are given. There are parables of those who invest wisely and those who invest poorly. And my question for you is this, do you value the work of the kingdom? Do you value the work that God is doing here? Do you value the work that God is doing through here? Do you value the work of planting new churches? Do you value the work of ministering to refugees? Do you value the work of helping church plants in India? Do you value the work that God is doing here at Trinity Anglican? And will you invest? Is your heart moved to value what God is doing here? Is your heart moved to generosity? Are you gripped by the image of the kingdom of God as your greatest joy and greatest value? You know, a lot of you are new. We love you. Welcome to our church. I am not someone who preaches on money all the time. However, we preach through books, and when it comes up, I will unashamedly do it. Part of being a Christian, part of discipleship, 
is investing our money, investing in stewarding what God has given us. And the question I have for you is, will you invest? Will you choose to give sacrificially? Will you choose to invest in the one place where you know there will be a good return on investment, the work of the kingdom of God? Family, I love the work God is doing in this church. I love the work God is doing through this church. Last year, we earmarked $65,000 to missions in our city, in our nation, and in our world. But not only that, every penny that's spent here is ultimately for mission. I believe that this is still the best place to raise your children in the entire city. I believe that our children need to be invested in And ultimately, that takes us utilizing our resources to serve them. Would you join me as we serve our families, as we serve the church, as we continue to serve the kingdom by investing generously as the Philippians invested in Paul? But finally, and most importantly, the ultimate mark of a healthy church. The mark of a church that if it's not there, it's not a church, is the grace of God. Look at verse 21 with me. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Isn't that beautiful, the converts in Caesar's household? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The last words you hear from a person are often a microcosm of their heart, aren't they? Their deepest values are revealed In one sentence, I was struck by Winston Churchill's last words, I'm bored with it all. The journey has been enjoyable and well worth taking once. So departed a man of wit, a man who faced profound suffering for the sake of others, a man who was clearly exhausted. T.S. Eliot simply said his wife's name, Valerie, the woman who held his heart. I've shared this with you before. I I don't think it was his last words ever, but they were the last words to me. My dear friend, Rob, who, who taught me so much, he said, as he lay dying, he repeated these words again and again, it's all a gift. It's all a gift. A man who was gripped by the nature of grace, that all of life is a gift given from God, even though his life was cut terribly short. And Paul in nearly every single one of his letters. It's not universally true. I checked, and I know you all are going to check. But almost every single letter, except Romans, and I couldn't find another one, but definitely not Romans, the word grace is in the ending line. Whether that's just grace be with you, or or the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, or whatever it might be, he always ends in grace. Because ultimately, this was his song. This was the truth that gripped his heart. This was the truth that pulled him out of works righteousness and brought him into true life with God. Remember who he was. He was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He persecuted the church. He kept all of the law, as he says just a few chapters before in Philippians. And yet, when Christ met him, he found life in grace that it was the work of Jesus Christ that saved him. It was the work of Jesus Christ to pay for his sins upon the cross, which he had far more of than he ever realized when he was under the law. It was the work of Jesus Christ to perfectly keep the law so that he could be presented to the Father as a perfect, righteous son, not living in fear, but living in assurance. It was grace that taught him to come into churches with, filled with people who were suspicious of him, who hated him, who didn't trust him because he drug their friends off to prison and death. It was grace that gave him life as God called him forth into existence and called him forth into new life in his son, Jesus Christ. Family, the word grace in the Bible, it's just gift. We so often think that it's this other word shot through with theological meaning, and it is today. However, when 
Paul was first using it, it was just a, a common word for gift. And Paul understood that he was given a profound gift, something that he didn't deserve, something that he could not claim for his own by anything that he could do, but something that was generously given to him. And family, if you've put your faith in Jesus, you have been given a profound gift, a gift that you cannot fathom, a gift that is being stored up for you in heaven, the hope of everlasting life, a gift of the church where we might be reconciled to one another in Jesus Christ, the gift that when God proclaims you are forgiven, it's actually true in a world where we hear you're forgiven all the time and we know it's not. In a world where we feel like our identities are constantly fragile, we are given the grace of knowing that we are made into sons. We are made into daughters. And nothing can remove that. There are many marks of a healthy church, but the mark of a church is the gospel of grace. And my prayer is if the Lord should ever call me home or the Lord should ever call me away, that is all you would remember from me. God actually loves you more than you know. That so often our lives are spent striving to earn our place, to earn our status, to earn power. But here, here, it is purely grace. Here, we respond in thanksgiving. Here, we respond in gratitude. Here, you are secure. I don't know what mark of a healthy church stuck out to you over the summer. You've heard me preach quite a bit about joy, because I pray that you all would be saturated in the joy of the Lord. You've heard me preach about grace again and again. You've heard me preach about many marks of a healthy church, and I would just want to ask you to do one thing, just one thing for me in the next week, whether that's after church today, maybe not during the passing of the peace, because we got to tighten that up a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Maybe at the barbecue next week. Maybe over coffee with someone. I want you to ask someone else what mark of a healthy church stuck out to them. Where the Holy Spirit moved them. Obviously, if you are married, speak to your spouse. If you have children that were in here the whole time, speak to them. But also speak to someone that's not in your family. And ask them, what did the Lord speak to you this summer? What is the Lord inviting you into? How is the Lord inviting you to strengthen this church as you walk in obedience? Because my prayer is that we would continue to be a light on a hill, a beacon of hope, a place of grace in a world that desperately needs it. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the grace that you have given us. Thank you that by your blood, we are washed white as snow. We are cleansed of our sins and brought into new life. Would that truth capture our hearts, capture our minds, capture our actions to the glory of your name. And may you continue to grow into, in this church your perfect will to the glory of your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.